originality is overrated. What? What did I just say? I am the Comics Kid 2099, and you heard me correctly. I am going to talk a little bit about how originality is sometimes given more importance by audiences, and maybe to a lesser degree creators, than really it needs to be. This video was kind of sparked in my mind by watching two things. Two days ago, I saw a video on the Escapist website by movie critic Movie Bob. Bob was talking about how audiences need to pay their money toward movies like Pacific Rim, Elysium, This is the End, as opposed to going to movies like Man of Steel, Star Trek Into Darkness, The Wolverine, or Iron Man 3. He was basically saying that these original properties deserve our money much more than remakes or adaptations of existing works outside of movies. Outside of the fact that I kind of disagree with that premise just on the face of it, I also don't really think that these original properties are all that original. Let's take Pacific Rim, for example. This was the one that he was really saying everyone and their mom needs to go see because apparently Movie Bob is telepathic and he could tell that the movie was going to be awesome even though he hadn't seen it. Now, I myself, I have not seen Pacific Rim, nor am I going to just because, well, the last time I went to go see a movie that looked like it had been tailored for my interests, it was called Sucker Punch, and it was awful. But I digress. The movie, is it original? Well, in the sense that it's not based on a book or a previously existing movie, yeah, it's original, but it's also not really that original. It's a movie about robots fighting giant kaiju that kinda sorta look like Godzilla. Have we heard of this before? Sure. Power Rangers, Voltron, Gundam Wing was about giant robots. Heck, there's been comic books about this. Have you heard of this before? This is a comic by Frank Miller and Frank Darrow called Big Guy and Rusty the Boy Robot. It was made into a cartoon on, I believe, Kids WB back in the early 2000s, late 90s. And, you guessed it, it's about two robots fighting a giant Godzilla-like creature. So is Pacific Rim original? No, not really. Since I haven't seen Pacific Rim, I can't speak to the quality of the movie, but hundreds of thousands of people are saying that it's the best thing that they've ever seen in their entire lives. So, are they enjoying it despite the fact that it's not really original? Heck yeah, they are. This lack of originality hasn't kept me from enjoying many other stories in the past. If you recall, a few months ago, I reviewed the pilot episode for the television series Alphas, in that review, I mentioned that Alphas is a straight-up ripoff of the X-Men. However, I went on to keep watching that show, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Even though you can not only say that Alphas is a straight-up ripoff, but you can also draw lines to specific characters from the X-Men to Alphas, and it makes quite a bit of sense, the parallels that you can draw. Let's go back to giant monster movies that are love letters to the Godzilla movies from the 50s and 60s. Have you heard of Cloverfield? A lot of people really didn't like Cloverfield. Even people who I respect their opinions, they were all acting like Cloverfield is a piece of garbage. And I respectfully disagree. I actually thought it was a really fun movie. I think it was doing what Godzilla movies are supposed to do and focus on the humans reacting to the giant monster as opposed to the giant monster tearing through the city. And I think it did a decent job of doing that. You want to know what's really funny? This movie wouldn't have existed without those Godzilla movies. Cloverfield, not really that original, but I still enjoyed it, and it can still exist as its own as a piece of art and story. Let's take it to a place that might really blow your mind, maybe. Have you heard of Star Wars? I'm sure you have. Star Wars, allegedly, is based on George Lucas's love of the old Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers serials from the 30s and 40s. You probably never thought you were going to hear someone compare Cloverfield to Star Wars, but there is a similarity between the two. Both of them involve a filmmaker who loves an earlier form of entertainment and they want to pay respect to that with a newer form of entertainment that also seeks to do something different. But Cloverfield is kind of a human story, seeing the human reactions to these characters, to this giant monster, and Star Wars is kind of a 
sort of human story that kind of ups the ante from the Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers stories from back in the day. But Star Wars takes it to a place that Cloverfield and a lot of these other ripoffs don't really go. This movie was so insanely popular, they made two sequels and then three prequels, and then there's been a whole bunch of expanded universe stuff which I can't even begin to get into. Basically, you've got other people who are not George Lucas, they're no longer looking at this as a love letter to Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. They're looking at it as its own thing, and then they start expanding on it based on what we got here. They see a line here, they see a character there, and they start exploring that, and they start turning it into a more three-dimensional character, or they take that one throwaway line and they turn it into a giant part of this large universe, and Star Wars becomes its own thing. Even hardcore fans may not realize that it used to be based on Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. I mentioned earlier that this video was sparked in my mind by two other things. The first one being Movie Bob talking about originality and how it's more important than remakes and adaptations. The second thing was a video that just went up very recently from filmmaker and writer Max Landis. Landis wrote the film Chronicle, which I didn't actually like that movie at all. However, it kind of falls into the pattern of those other movies that I was talking about. Before Chronicle came out, a lot of people were saying, this looks like the movie Acura, but with white people instead of Japanese people. And I can sort of see the similarities. Both movies involve a troubled child who gets superpowers and then decides that he's better than everyone else. And then both movies end with the child, spoiler, dying after he tries to kind of tear everything up with his superpowers. Now, there's also a lot of differences between Acura and Chronicle. Chronicle is about three kids who all get superpowers from a mysterious source. Acura is about one kid who gets superpowers, and it's set in a dystopian Japan, and there's a lot more backstory involved. But I digress. Max Landis. He did a video that was basically detailing his pitch for what he would do with the death of Superman. According to this video, which I highly recommend you go watch, just go on YouTube and type Max Landis Death of Superman, in the video it was revealed that in 2012, DC Comics was going to have Max Landis and comic book writer Greg Pak do a year-long weekly comic book series that was going to cover the death of Superman. Max Landis, in the actual video, said that this was going to kind of be along the lines of All-Star Superman, where you can pick and choose what you wish to be canonical in the story, but you're not beholden to all 80 years of Superman history, so you can do whatever you want, basically. Anyway, in the video, it's basically revealed that DC Comics wasn't really wanting to do a year-long weekly series, which is interesting because they had done three weekly series before that in the form of 52, Countdown to Final Crisis, and Trinity. So I'm not really sure why a couple of years later they were saying, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. But for whatever reason, they said, no, 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 we can't do that. After getting into this video, I began asking myself, why doesn't Max Landis just go ahead and do this story? And yeah, I know, DC said no, but that didn't stop J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves from making Cloverfield. That didn't stop young filmmaker George Lucas from making Star Wars. That didn't stop Max Landis from making an Acura movie in the form of Chronicle. Watching this video about Max Landis' version of The Death of Superman kind of made me think of all of these other storytellers out in the internet. I'm thinking of a few people specifically. Some of them, they are aspiring writers who haven't actually broken in just yet. And some of them are very famous writers who I love and adore. Sometimes, for whatever reason, these writers want to do a story and then other circumstances prevent them from telling that story. For example, Chris Claremont had a run on the X-Men that lasted 16 years, and then due to internal conflicts within the company, Chris Claremont left in 1991. Years and years later, Claremont basically revealed a couple of years of plots that he had in mind if he had stayed on X-Men back in 1991. These plots included a really massive epic war with the Shadow King, who around the time when Chris Claremont left, he was just getting started using that character again. 
And then he had other ideas, like Wolverine was going to be taken over by the Hand and was going to be a villain for a couple of years. And Wolverine and Jean Grey were going to have a relationship instead of Jean Grey and Cyclops. Stuff like that. You can go Google Chris Claremont's ideas for X-Men and you could probably pretty easily find it. The problem is, eventually, we get to the year 2010, somewhere around that area, Chris Claremont comes back to Marvel Comics to do a series called X-Men Forever. And the basic premise of this is, what if Chris Claremont never left the X-Men comics in 1991? So X-Men Forever Issue 1 is kind of supposed to be read immediately after Adjectiveless X-Men Issue 3. Okay, really awesome, right? If you love the 16-year period that Chris Claremont was on X-Men, then this is just for you, right? Uh, but the problem is, Chris Claremont had already revealed all of his ideas that he was going to do with the X-Men before he started X-Men Forever. So, very quickly into X-Men Forever, I realized this is not what they were selling it as. This is an entirely different story, and it just barely qualifies under the premise that they sold it as. Well, that story, I didn't actually care for it anyway, but the problem I realized was that this can never be what they are telling us that it is because Chris Claremont, before X-Men Forever, had basically given up on those stories. So he said, well, if I'm not going to be able to do these as a comic book, then I'm just going to give them to the audiences for free. So he gets on his keyboard, typey type 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 and then we have the ideas that he was going to use around 1992-1993 in the X-Men comics. And that brings me back to Max Landis in his Death of Superman pitch video. I kept thinking, why can't Max Landis just create his own superhero universe? Maybe he could write a novel. Maybe he could do a really huge budget superhero movie. Or maybe he could write a comic book for IDW, Dark Horse, Boom Studios, Oni Press. The point is, Max Landis seems to be a pretty creative guy. And while I did have a few little nitpicks on his Death of Superman video, a lot of those nitpicks would have gone away if Max Landis had said, Okay, I'm going to do a story with my very own superhero characters. Originally, this was planned to be a Death of Superman story, but since DC Comics said, no, 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 I'm going to do it as my own thing. So, we're no longer going to have Batman, Superman, and Doomsday. We're going to have character X, character Y, and character Z. And you might be saying, oh, but that's not original. Aha! But that's the point, isn't it? A few weeks back, I did a video called Mark Wade Stole My Idea. And in that video, I basically talked about how Mark Wade is doing this series called Irredeemable. It's a comic book from Boom Studios, and he also did a spinoff called Incorruptible. And the basic idea is you have a character who is Superman, but his name is not Superman, and he basically goes evil, and then it's a story about how the rest of the world is coping with that and what happens next. Basically, I'm just going to go right out there and say that, that story could not have existed without the character of Superman. Now, I'm not saying that Mark Wade is a hack. I am not saying that Mark Wade has no more original ideas at all. I absolutely do not think that that is true. I think Mark Wade saw the potential in the premise of what if Superman went evil, and he probably knew that DC Comics wasn't going to go for that, so he preempted them and just went ahead and made his own story. So my question is, why couldn't Max Landis do that with his Superman story? I certainly probably would have bought it, although admittedly I wouldn't have known to bought it unless I knew that it was originally a Death of Superman story, and well, I digress. This brings me to a few bloggers I follow. One of them specifically has done a semi-ongoing series of blog posts about what he would do if he was writing a certain character at Marvel or DC. He has done several of these, something like over 50 of them, and every time he does one of these, I enjoy the heck out of it, but I always keep saying, you could just do your own thing, and I think people would really dig it. You've got an audience here on your blog site, why not just do your own story? Now, I do want to go ahead and say, sometimes taking a story that is not yours and then trying to turn it into your own story doesn't necessarily work at all. 
Do you remember a movie from circa 2005 called Aragon? Well, this was from a time in my life when I wasn't really as smart about storytelling as I feel like I am now. Yeah, I know, way to toot my own horn. When I saw Aragon, the first thought that immediately went through my head was, I've seen this movie before. Yeah, Aragon was basically Star Wars, and I don't mean it's vaguely influenced by Star Wars, like Star Wars was vaguely influenced by Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. No, I mean that beat for beat, Aragon was Star Wars. Like, there was no room for this story to be its own thing because it was trying so dang hard to be something else. In a case like that, I would say that a little originality would have gone a long way. Maybe they could have taken characters and gotten rid of them because, hey, this is trying too much to be like Star Wars. Maybe they could have taken other characters and said, well, in Star Wars, Obi-Wan Kenobi dies so that he can't help the hero along his journey any further. But maybe in Aragon, Obi-Wan Kenobi can be a traitor. I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there. I haven't actually read the novels that that movie is based on. I don't really know if they're good or bad. I know a few people have said, yeah, they're really good. Me personally, I'm saying... Eh, if I want to read Star Wars, I'll just watch Star Wars. Yeah, sometimes if a creator takes a story that is not theirs, and all they do is change all of the names in the story, and then say, look at this, this is my original work, read it, love it, uh, it's probably not going to work out too well for them. Admittedly, that worked out fairly well for the lady who wrote Aragon, I think it was a lady. Most of the time, I'm going to say, no, that's not going to work out too well for you. I want to end this video just by saying, Sometimes, originality is not all there is to making a story. Sure, there are some stories that are very original. There are plenty of movies that I love, and I can't say, well, let's draw a line back to X, Y, and Z, and yeah, this movie is definitely a copy of that movie. There are plenty of movies I like that are original but there are just as many that I like that are not original, that are very clearly copies of something that came before. But I want to go ahead and put this out there. Once a story is put out into the open, it no longer belongs to the creator. Once George Lucas finally was finished making this movie, it was no longer George Lucas's idea. Star Wars now belongs to the public. Anyone can watch and enjoy Star Wars, and it can be their entertainment. Now, I'm not saying that I could go out there and make an Obi-Wan Kenobi movie and get away with it. I would get into tons of legal trouble if I tried to do that. What I'm saying is, if I really like Star Wars and I wanted to make a story about a police force that patrols the galaxy and saves the day from evil, well, I would probably get in trouble with DC Comics for trying to make a Green Lantern story. But hopefully you maybe see what I'm saying. Some stories are so influential, they are so impacting on the pop culture that it makes sense that other creators are going to be inspired by that and they are going to take that story and put their own spin on it. And I encourage that because if we didn't encourage that, if we said, no, we can only have original stuff, you cannot pay homage, you cannot take that story and tell it in your own way, then we wouldn't have all the stories that we love today. We would just have, well, some really great stories, but a lot of really great stories we would be doing without. I hope this video made a lot of sense to you. It makes sense in my mind. I just hope that from here to here, it got out in the way that I wanted it to get out. I hope you liked this video. If you did, I hope you will like, share, comment, and subscribe. I don't know what I was doing there. And I will see you guys tomorrow with a different kind of video. Until then, have a great day.